this is a writer's workshop and um, me and my friend Marjorie Freeman started this because we were on the editorial team for a large publication that no longer exists. Um, and we were frustrated, well not frustrated, like we wanted to help empower our writers, like be technical writers because creative writing is not the same. You know, we, we, we would have to like go through an editorial process with them and we figured if we gave these sort of workshops it would be less of the editorial process because we'd get it kind of right the first time. So Marjorie Freeman helped me write this and this is based off of actually a speaker diversity workshop that the Drupal um, community took from Jill Binder from the WordPress community. So I always like to kind of let people know that this came from open source and it's sort of iterated and now it's a writer's workshop. And it is three hours shoved in to 50 minutes. So, woo! Okay, my name is Amy June, title Camel Case. Um, I'm Volkswagen chick across all of the media. Um, I, um, I now work at the Linux Foundation and technical writing is still something that's really important to me because I help people write exam questions. And, and um, when people come to documentation or when they come and look at your technical publications, like the flowers and the unicorns and the glitter can be really distracting. And so this is sort of an exercise in what's important, what's succinct, what's important when you want to get information across. There are images in the slide deck but for brevity, I'm not gonna um, describe them. If they're important to the content, I will though. But most of them are just for uh, like decoration. Spot, he's my cat. Um, a little timeline here. What, 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 what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna help you find your why, your what, and your words. Because sometimes that's the hardest part is coming up with a topic. So we'll dispel some myths. We won't quite do a brainstorming activity because we don't have time, but I'll share the slide deck and um, there'll be like writer's prompts in the slide deck. We'll just do that so we can get back in. Um, and then we'll talk about the difference between articles and the, the difference between documentation and, and um, figure out like what to write. And then if we have time, we'll do a little markdown demonstration because markdown is really cool because from an editorial point of view, when someone gives you a Google Doc and you copy and paste it into Drupal, you got all those scan, the spans and all that stuff. But then if you strip it, you don't get any of the formatting. So Markdown is this really easy way to share your information and share it formatted. And Markdown's in core now, so that's kind of cool. But that's if we have time. So dispelling the myths. Um, lots of people think that they don't want to write because they're not an expert. Um, that's okay. You don't have to be an expert. Everyone has a different idea of what expert means. No one knows everything and everyone has something to learn. So your perspective, your lived experience, the way you work with the, with the product or whatever it is, is different. Um, so you could always know more about the topic than your audience. Myth two, um, people will ask questions or make comments at the end and I can't answer and I'll look like a fool. Um, People might ask questions, that's true, but really the reader, most of the readers, we're gonna assume like um, the best intentions for everyone. Um, your reader understands that you don't know everything and so sometimes if the answer is I don't know, that's okay. But if you do answer something like I don't know, you know it's a good learning experience. Go back and you find that little bit of information and you'll learn something else and then the next time you write about it, you can write about that new thing. I failed if my page views are low when we're talking about a publication. Um, if you reach, I'm like hitting the buttons all over the place. If you reach three readers today, and this goes up the same with when you give talks, if you reach three readers, if three people are in your talk, that is three more people than yesterday. 300% value, or do the math, I don't know. But um, you've just enriched and better someone's life. So it doesn't matter what your page views are. Someone's looking for your content and they're gonna appreciate what you, what you write. And then the last myth about a lot of the writing is, for technical publications, that a how-to is the only format that you can use to share your knowledge. And that's not true. And we're gonna go over a bunch of different formats you can use, especially if you're a first-time writer or um, your uh, 
um, we'll go over it. So <laughs> I have a tendency to like talk about the slides before they come up, so I have to remember like that we're going to talk about it later. So why haven't you written? Anybody? Um, intimidated. Intimidated? Yeah. Anybody else? Like, why haven't you written, or why have you written only once? It's okay, I'm an extrovert, y'all, you know, don't have to answer the questions, but kind of think about it. Like, why haven't you written for a larger publication? You know, and then if you've only, like, wrote a read me once and contributed to Drupal, you know, in the form of documentation, why haven't you done it again? So why do we write? Um, well, we share information, we promote open source, it helps you build your own personal brand too. Even if you're writing for your company, like say you work, you work at Lullabot and you're on the Lullabot blog, you can use that on your resume. You know, If you write technical documentation, if you have an article on opensource.net, it helps build your personal brand because your profile is yours and your article is still there when, when you leave. And then we always learn something by teaching someone because we want to make sure our information's right. So if it's a topic you're passionate about and you're writing an article, you have a tendency to learn about it because you want to, you know, you want to get all the information right. And then we create more experts when we share our information. The hardest part is actually writing. Um, and uh, so, I used to work for opensource.com before Red Hat did, decided they didn't care about open source. But I always like to give people places that they can write because you'll have some resources. So when opensource.com dissolved, the community of writers were really good and they started and it just recently started up as opensource.net. It's a WordPress site, but that's okay. We won't judge them very much. Um, the Drop Times is our new kind of Drupal go-to for places. Technical, technically we write, this is one of the writers from opensource.com, and he takes articles that aren't necessarily open source too. So like if you have some sort of thing that you really are passionate about, it's all about like how you write, and he loves Drupal topics because Drupal is a platform for getting out your content. Sysadmins, you know, that's more like your get and your you know, command line stuff. And then Drupal Camp Asheville, which is one of the better camps around um, in July in Ash Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we have a, 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 what's it called, a narrow diversity initiative where we want people to share their information and we know that not everyone wants to talk, so we invite people to put articles up for um, Drupal Camp Asheville. And then they get published on um, Drupal Planet. So there's some places that you can write. And I always like to give that because not, I have a topic, but where am I going to post it, right? So here, here you go. Finding a topic. Um, we're going to do a brainstorm, and it's going to be super quick, just an exercise, so you can, can kind of like look and see how you can do it. I always tell people, you're not looking for perfect. You're not even looking for good when you brainstorm an idea. You're just looking for ideas, because as you go through the, the process of writing, you kind of narrow it down. And then when you think about what kind of article you write, you can narrow it down even further. So we're going to do a big mind dump, and again, well, I didn't bring paper, so maybe um, if you have a computer or a notepad or keep it in your brain, we'll just do this little quick exercise. So we're in Drupal, so think about like your favorite module or theme. What are some cool tricks that you use all the time? Do you have some keystrokes? Do you have a program that helps you save time? You know, or or um, a program that you use um, to track where you are throughout the day. What's a cool thing that you've created? What's the last thing you learned and how did you learn it? You know, kind of a case study of your learning process, what resources you used. What do you want to learn next? And what's the biggest challenge you've had with Drupal or open source or technology in general and how did you overcome that biggest challenge? And I think I have some more, but we're gonna skip it for brevity. But like I said, I'll share the slide deck, but it's just an exercise in like getting down all your ideas on paper. You know, simple things like, you know, maybe you're a creative and how is UX different from design? Because not everyone knows that and that's good information. You know, how did you learn to write? You know, if you're a mentor, you know, how is your mentoring experience? 
How's your past experience shape who you are today? I did a keynote yesterday where that's why I talked and I wove that story and people love those kind of stories. Wow, okay. Um, so more than just a how-to, we're gonna go into like different article styles. And this is sort of uh, kind of cut in half. I talk half about technical articles and then about documentation. So we have introductions to or getting started guides. You know, when you brainstorm and you have that big list, you know, pick two topics that, um, that you're interested in. Um, it's a style to use when you're talking about a topic that you're very confident about. It's something that you've done, you know, four, five, six, seven times and you write this how-to. There's, a, is that a duplicate slide? Oh, well, this is a how-to or tutorial, and the other one's a getting started guide, so a little bit different. So getting started is like your bare minimum, how do you start the project, where your how-to is more in-depth. Uh, once you get in there, you know, how do you configure something? How do you, um, how do you, uh, 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 it's more with pictures and diagrams and source code and other visuals, and we'll talk about visuals in a few minutes. We have lists or listicles. These are pretty fun. Um, they're quick and easy reads, like maybe it's a, a collaboration article where you ask uh, a one question to a bunch of different people, or maybe it's all of the articles that you liked over the summer and you write a blurb about them, and that way you're sharing your information, you share your favorite articles of the summer. Personal stories, these are like case studies, but for people, and they can be career journeys, they can be how did you set up Linux on your desktop, and how many times did it make you cry. Um, Personal stories are great. Um, not always good for, for uh, technical publications, but they're really good for your own personal blog or maybe your company's blog. And then we have case studies where it's a detailed study of specific, specific subjects, situations, person, uh, or occurrence. And did anyone see the Dries note? And he talked about the, the Promote Drupal initiative. So case studies are a great way to promote Drupal and they're looking for more case studies on Drupal.org. We want people to know how we're using Drupal. We want people from the outside to understand that. So case studies are a great way to contribute back to Drupal right now because we want to promote Drupal. And then the last one I have is like a roundup. It's like a listicle, but it's skimmable, like where you know someone on a cell phone, you know, you're, they're scrolling and they can get the, the gist of what you want. So documentation styles, um, there's readmes, you know, these are things that are in the code but aren't code. They're a text file that describes and kind of launches a project. A readme can be a basic for Drupal, that basic configuration, what do you need to set up, set up the module. And then um, we have user manuals, which are uh, informational guides. And in Drupal, these can be our external documentation guides. Uh, on a project page, you know, we have the README, but we also have external documentation. So that's your user manual of how you actually use the product or the code. And this sometimes is like standards and guidelines, troubleshooting, um, functionalities, and stuff like that. And then we have reference material and training manuals. Um, again, this is abbreviated a little bit. So getting started, and this is kind of why we're here. So finding your why, your what, and your words. Now, like I said before, this is a writer's workshop, but you can kind of apply all of these basic things to writing a proposal or pitching a talk um, for conferences, a good way also to promote Drupal. Um, it's good for uh, sharing your personal message or an elevator pitch. So we talk about the five W's and an H. Um, what are you talking about? Who are you telling this to and who is your audience? This is something to think about before you write your article. Under what circumstances are they using it? That's your, um, your when and your where. And this could also include the how. How would they use it? And why? Why are you telling this, these, your audience about whatever it is you're telling about them about? The why. In the following slides, I'm gonna like read a prompt using one of um, my favorite tools, which is Markdown, and um, we're gonna kind of call out the five W's and an H in this paragraph, so we can kind of break it down a little bit. So the what, what are we sharing? So we're gonna look at this paragraph and we're gonna think about, can you identify the what? 
So we're technical community advocates and we enjoy using Markdown to help ex expedite the editorial process for a community of writers. Markdown helps lower certain barriers to entry by masking the complexity of technical writing and bridges the gap between technical writers and developers. It's straightforward and anyone can get started today. So what are we focusing on in that paragraph? Markdown. Yep. Markdown is the focus of, of the, 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 the passage. So now we're going to look at the art, the, that passage again and think about the who. Who are we talking about? The community of writers. Community of writers. If you guessed writers or technical writers, um, you'd be correct. Um, the passage is really focused on the effects of the writers in relation to the developers. But why? So why do we suggest using Markdown to writers? So can we identify the why in the same passage? The bridge of the gap. Math, well, it can be that. That's the thing about this. There could be a couple of different whys. Marjorie likes to say it's masking the complexity of technical writing, and that's the why. Um, uh, we use Markdown to make writing and pitching less scary. You know, it's not HTML and it's not a text document. Um, so under what circumstances does it mask the complexity? So the where and the when. Can you suggest you where, when and where or how do we suggest using Markdown to writers? Same passage. It's for the editorial process. And then the how. Um, this is where you define the application for your what. The, it's like the real meat and potatoes, is that the, the way to say it? I'm a vegetarian, so I don't always like, <laughs> like maybe meat and tofu, um, of what you're trying to talk about, the how. This usually prompts people um, to read the article. Um, on the editorial team for the publication I work for, um, we had an SEO team that specialized in optimizing uh, the articles for what you would want to be descriptive and, but, and be as concise as possible so people can kind of pinpoint what they're looking for. Because there's nothing like going to a Google search and the search words you're looking for and then the article's about something else. So really like defining that how is pretty important. So the how here is um, how does Markdown work? It bridges the gap between technical writers and developers. And this was just an exercise in identifying those, 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 those five W's in the H, or the four W's in the H, five W's. Um, but Marjorie says, as long as you have a clear what in mind, you're kind of ready to write. Um, no matter where you are in your writer's journey, understanding what you're trying to say is that first step. And that's always the hardest. Um, but at the end of the day, if your audience understands what you're writing about, the particular topic, you're on the right track. This is for the exercise that we do during the workshop. Um, so technical writers are experts at translating highly technical subjects into more digestible formats for the end user. You know, if we, it's that gap between the developers and the end users because sometimes developers will use jargon and words that the end users don't understand. So that's a really important part of technical articles and documentation is breaking down that barrier. They're an informal way that you can um, share your facts and information. And usually we try to do it in, a, in an unbiased perspective. Um, a technical article does not have to be about technology, per se. It can be about the logistics, it could be about the practice or the science behind the topic. Um, and it really is, like I said, breaking down that technical stuff into digestible chunks for the, your end user. So how do you start a technical article? Um, we suggest um, that you write down three steps it requires to do the things. Three, because if you think about like someone scrolling, on the phone, because a lot of us do that. We don't, we're not on our laptops anymore. We're on the train and we're scrolling. So keeping your, your, your 
technical art articles like really tight is important, so we'd like to stick to that rule of three. And if there's more than three steps, cool, you can write another article. You know, you always think about expanding that. Um, and then under each step, so you have your three steps, we like to break it down like an outline where you can have the three sub steps. You know, so you have plenty of room, but keep it to like those three main parts. Our first paragraph, you know, when we introduce our article, introduces why someone is reading the article. And that closing section reminds people of why they read that article. Um, it's really to close out the conversation and leave the uh, writer with a call to action. So kind of break it down, like, like I said, like, what is, your, what is your article about? Have your three steps, have your sub steps, and then remind people of the three things that they learned and then call with a, end it with a call to action. This is an article on opensource.com and it's not very accessible to see here on the screen, but we can see that, um, I think this is from Amid, um, he's broken it down into one, two, and three. And you can see like he's got an opening paragraph and then he's got his topics at the bottom. But really, you know what I mean? Like really just kind of defining those three things. So technical documentation is a little different than a technical article because it's a more formal writing style that really describes whatever it is you're talking about, where your article is more, it has a little bit more flowers and glitter and unicorns where your technical documentation is just the, just, just the basics, right? So you want to be clear, concise, and succinct. You really want to go for that economy of words. Um, you want to eliminate words that um, might not be uh, or might be jargon or buzzwords because w w with the internet we have a global audience. So be very mindful that things don't always translate. And then using jargon too that's specific to your trade doesn't always work because people you'll lose your readers when you're when when you use a lot of jargon. You want to use specific nouns when you write. You don't want to um, use things like thing or this, you want to make sure that, well, when you don't have nouns, there's confusion. Like, what is this talking about? So be specific with the this, like you would be with pronoun. You know, don't say this, go the article, the Volkswagen, the thing, you know, so be specific with your nouns. Um, those sentences that use this, like I said, it's, uh, it can confuse your audience and um, the more they read on and the more they're confused, you're gonna lose your content consumer. Um, you wanna make sure that you use active versus passive voice. This one I struggle with a lot. I'm not good at it. But when you use an active voice versus a passive voice, it also calls into that economy of words. When you talk about things passively, you have a tendency to describe them too much. So keep it succinct. You want to avoid huge walls of text, even in technical documentation in an article, because um, people might not, um, they might glance away, and then if you have a huge wall of text, they don't know where they left off. So make sure that you break up your content with uh, structure. Use headings and subheadings. This is also good for accessibility. People who use a screen reader rely on those headings as they navigate. But also, again, when we're scrolling, Maybe we're not interested in the whole article. So having that article in the headings really breaks up the content. And then if you have a style guide, stick to it. So Drupal has a style guide. When we write a readme, we want like code blocks and things written in a certain way. So if there is a style guide, become familiar with it. You know, I think every organization has a little bit of a style guide, but usually the marketing team will help you um, with that. So subheadings, we talked a little bit about this. If your article is more than 500 words, we want to break up that text. When we do things like interviews, we want to break them up where we use bold for who's, who's talking and then the rest in, in plain text. Um, inline formatting, um, you can use italics and bolding and that sort of thing, but they're not always accessible. They're not always seen um, or they're not always uh, apparent to people who aren't reading the article visually. So if you're using bolding and italics, be mindful if it's semantic, like if your WYSIWYG marks it that way, like if a screen reader's reading it, 
you know, you know, you don't want it to be just a visual. You want to make sure that if it's important, that that people know that it's there. Code formatting. If your article contains code, if you're using like a WYSIWYG like CK Editor Five, you know, you use the code tag. Um, Markdown has different ways that you can do code too. And I really want to talk about code formatting because in an article, don't use an image of code. Does anyone know why? Why? Yeah, because when you're writing technical things, people want to copy and paste it. And when it's an image, they if you've done your images right and you you know, done an alt tag, they would have to go in and find the alt tag to copy and paste it. So writing it out is accessible because people are going to copy and paste it. Underlining. Don't underline things. Reserve that for, for, for links. Like old school people, like when we see an underlined word, we think it's a link. So underlining is one of those things that like you just try to avoid. And then hyperlinks, you know, make sure that you're, you follow like the protocol of however you want, if you want it to open in a new page or if you want it to open in a new tab. Um, when you link to an outside source within the article, like be mindful that they might not come back. So, or not, no, if it opens, yeah, you want it to open in a new tab because you want your article to remain open. So think about that when you when you put links in, in your articles. You want to create a persona. You know, you want to like identify who your audience is. I, is it a technical audience? So maybe you can use a little bit more um, technical words. You know, are you writing a white paper for a college, or are you writing like a basic like how to on how to install Linux? on your machine. So really think about who you're writing to and keep that in mind. And then evergreen content. You want to future proof your writing, you know? It's okay for like a news release and something like that, but if you have something that's real specific to that time, it's not evergreen and people aren't going to go back, it's not going to be relevant. Or halfway through the article you're going to lose your content consumer. So if you do write stuff, go back and update as you go, you know, keep that in mind. Revise and update it keeps the content fresh. And sometimes when you update your content, you you know you might change some of the SEO words. You might change you know what the article's about, and then you know Google's going to search it again and it's going to come back into your searches. But yeah, just keep your content up to date. So I am opinionated and. AI is one of these things that people use, and I understand that. And a blank page can be a scary thing. So I want to remind folks when you use these AI tools that and I'm not talking about like Grammarly or spell check. You know, I'm talking about the writing tools. Um, AI models are only as good as the data that they have access to. So you know how biased our internet is? You know, um, governance is always changing too. Like, you know, there's some places in tech where we don't want, I think there's like rules now about AI and Drupal too, like using GPT chat and stuff like that. If you do use AI, be mindful that that information came from someone else. So it's someone else's information. Someone else, it might not be Creative Commons and it might not be open source. So if you do use AI for, to fill that blank page, make sure that you make it your own. Revise it and make it your own. Like there's a, I think that there's a lot of risk for plagiarism and creative licensing and things like that. And um, again, it might not be accurate and use content when you make it your own. But mostly like the internet is very biased, so think about it. Like, there's all these years of like all this languaging and all these things, and AI pulls that right up for you. Um, grammar and spelling. Most of the time, you have someone help you out with that, but you know, use use your spell check and use your grammarly that first time before you submit an article, just to get that kind of spot check. Um, that helps when you submit an article that there's not that back and forth with the editorial process. But with saying that, I want to remind folks that like, if English isn't your first language, don't worry about it because there are people to help you with that. You know, So I tell people, do the spell check, do the grammarly, but 
editors want to publish you, you know, so they will work with you. And if, if, if your barrier to entry is your fear that English isn't your first language, I don't want you to fear that because there are people to help. We get asked a lot about word count for articles. Um, and a lot of times we don't worry about word count when we're, when we're publishing stuff, so we don't want you to. But we, um, uh, me and Marjorie have sort of a guideline. 500 to 600 words um, might uh, provide like a project update or an announcement. Um, it could be like, a, like some of your evergreen content. 600 to 800 words is a good length for uh, a feature article or a column. Um, and if we think about print, a one to two magazine spread is about 750 words with your images in it. So, you know, the, the fold is about 750 words if you want to think about print. Um, it's a good range for uh, like an interview or walking people through uh, uh, different steps to your project. 800 to 1300 words, these are your more in-depth things, your tutorials, your roundups. Um, if your article is more than 1300 words, you might consider breaking it up into two articles, you know, if you can do that. Um, uh, do a multiple step process because um, people don't read anymore, they scan. So 1300 words is a lot to like be scrolling. And then that feature article too, like, um, be mindful of screen sizes. Like, think about a cell phone screen and what fits in a cell phone. I mean, I hate to say this, but it's true. Like, if you have a, if you have more than 1,300 words, I think you scroll 22 times. That's a lot. So, you know what I mean? Like, think of your audience and who's reading it. So, um, breaking it up, that way they have a second article to read later. Um, maybe it keeps them engaged. You know, you're doing a project update, things like that. Images are cool, you know, they bring us ROI. Um, people are more likely to click on an article that has a hero image. People are more likely to click on your social media post if it has an image. They're a great return on investment. Um, if you do submit images, like in our technical documentation or for open source publications, make sure you check the licensing that you can share it. We don't want to be stealing things from people. Um, When you submit articles, um, we recommend that you submit the images as files rather than putting them in your Google Doc or your Markdown text and having them se separate. Um, be mindful about your image size. GIMP is a tool that you can use to, that's real straightforward and there's an article on opensource.com that tells you how to like ma make your images different sizes. So a good exercise is you know, um, opening and closing your your screen and making sure that it doesn't pixelate, you know, so, you know, get that image size correct. Uh, label your images so when it's in your article, the editors will know where to put it. And always include captions or alternative text because I can guess that it's a red house sitting on a hill, but is that your intent? It might be that you're providing that image because it's a red house sitting on a hill with a dog barking in the background. So my description of your art, of your image may be different than what you're trying to get across from, to, your, to your audience. So you know, make sure that you provide alternative text. And not all alternative text is the same. Like I said, an image can have different um, uh, alternative text. Um, oh, Marjorie is really nice here. Um, yeah, uh, I can talk a lot. I actually do a workshop on alternative text and I talk about it and I, Actually, like when I give a talk, it's kind of funny because I don't describe my images because they're decorative and I don't think they're important. But for me, in an article, you included that image for a reason. You evoke some sort of emotion. You, there's a re if, if there's no reason for you to include an image, why include it? You know. So think about decorative images and just marking them as decorative, you know, if you're invoking emotion, if there's something to say, there's a reason you included that image. But again, that's not what this talks about. So links, um, no one wants to publish an article with a whole bunch of links to your company. If the whole thing is about promoting your company, it's technical articles probably aren't for you. Save that for your, um, your biography. But you know, links are always subject to um, 
the editorial staff. Okay, more ten minutes. Okay, um, but you can include links. You know, people want to know like some resources. So think about and be like real subjective to the links that you include. You know, use links to the open source project that you're referencing. You know, include links to Wikipedia. Um, Include links to technical ideas or terms that you can't explain. Remember, we wanted to like break down that jargon, but if there's just a word that you have no idea how to break down for someone, include a link to the definition of that word. You know, spell out acronyms, things like that. I'm just going to see kind of where we are here. Oh, crud. Okay. Um, we're going to talk really briefly about titles, outlines, bodies, and key elements. So. Titles are what bring people in, but again, you want to be short, concise, and tight. Catchy titles are okay, but make sure they explain what, you, what it is. Um, because it's always a little fun to have that little playfulness, like, oh, what is that person talking about? But make sure that it says something about your article at the same time. Um, because if you're too quippy or too clever, people might not understand it. And use a title that can stand alone. And then think of SEO, search engine optimi optimization, in your title. Think about what your article's about and what people are going to search for and try to include one of those in your title. So creating the outline, we want an introduction, we want to be clear about what we're writing, what you're going to cover, why does it matter, what's your hook. Remember that first paragraph is where people are going to leave more often. Um, so what's your hook? Why should people be reading your article? Explain in that first paragraph who you're writing it for, and again, be succinct. And in the body, we have that story of three. You know, what's the main point you're talking about? What's a logical flow? And then have your three supporting points. Now, I write not too often for technical, for technical articles, but sometimes it takes me a while to get that flow right. So, you know, just remember, like, that first time you write it, you might not get it right. So don't get discouraged. Just kind of rearrange your stuff. And then always refer to your five W's. You know, again, who is the project for? What does the project solve? Why was the project created? How does it work? When would you use it? Where would you use it? Those five W's and um, the H. Again, this is my conclusion, so I'm summarizing, right? We want to summarize what the article discussed. We want to take, you know, be brief about those takeaway points. But more importantly, at that bottom of the article, you want to, you don't want your reader to be like, so what? You want to explain that what at the end. Make sure that you, you, you um, that they understand why you wrote it, what the thing is, that kind of thing. Um, the end is where you can give more resources, and then in your bio, you know, give people some contact information. That way, if they have a question, maybe there's not a comment section. It, uh, it gives people a, an opportunity to ask you questions and engage. And some bonus tips: um, always define acronyms, num numerums, and abbreviations. You know, um, me and Cat work on a project called Ally Talks. It's A one one Y, but people might not understand what that is. Internationalization is one in the Drupal community. We do I eighteen N. So if you have an acronym, make sure the first time you have a key that you that you write it out. Um, Use predefined reading levels. You know, um, I think usability.gov recommends writing at the ninth grade reading level. And then, of course, there's exceptions. You're writing a white paper and things like that. Um, and then if we're talking about a global audience, people recommend even writing lower at the fifth and the sixth and the seventh grade reading level. So there's tools that you can use online that will check your reading level. Um, don't use fonts that people can't read. And usually for technical thing that you submit, they're going to have their own thing. But um, avoid special characters, things like ampersands. Like that doesn't always translate on foreign keyboards. People don't know what an ampersand is. And then avoid using emoticons and ASCII art in your articles because as a screen reader user, if you have a bunch of, and I, I'm going to call out Mike Herschel right here in the mm -hmm. Olivero theme. Um, if you have a lot of emoticons in your readme, that screen reader is going to read all of that. So think about like, like I'll use, uh, what Twitter's called now, I don't know, but 
are they still called tweets? Are they called X's? I don't know what they're called. Um, so in those not tweets, if you have like every other word as an emoticon, your screen reader is going to be reading that. You know, word, emoticon, word, emoticon, word, emoticon. And that's the same in our articles. It just doesn't translate well. It's not inclusive. Write to one person using a singular everything. Um, write if your reader is doing the task right now, especially for those how-tos and, and uh, introductory things. Um, you know, uh, you're making a sandwich, you know, spread the peanut butter. Well, where do you spread the peanut butter? Do I spread the peanut butter on my arm? No, I spread the peanut butter on the sandwich, you know, things like that. Um, and then Marjorie always says that if you have bonus tips, it doesn't count towards that rule of three. That's like, oh, that last little spark idea that I have to include. And then try typing your topic into your search engine and see what people are saying about it. And then I am out of time, but I have a section on using Markdown. Um, but I'm going to leave on a real positive note. Um, so we have a prominent sponsor in our Drupal community. Um, in light of this community sponsor, I like to remind people to um, review your hosting platform's acceptable use policy and see if it matches your own values. Um, now, this company uh, has since changed it, but not soon enough. But I just want to remind folks that, you know, think about who's in our community and why we use a product and who our consumers are and try to love and um, uh, accept everyone because hatred in any form is truly not acceptable. And if you want to talk to me about after the recording who it is, I'll be kind enough to share. Um, and then, like, I do a little tutorial on Markdown and we don't have time, but I've got three minutes so we can look at the slides real quick and just kind of, I want people to understand how straightforward Markdown is and how accessible it is. It's portable, you can use it from one place to another. Um, you don't have to, for accessibility, a person doesn't have to use a mouse to use Markdown, they can use keystrokes. So, I say why use it, because it's cool, it's in core. Um, we have some cool editors and not so cool editors. Oh. Can you pause on the cool editors slide? Sure. I actually don't have it up, so we're not going to look at it. Um, so these are open source markdown um, uh, editors. So VS Code is not open source, so people know. VS Codium is. Um, little distinction there. VS Code tracks stuff. So that's why I say VS Codium. A lot of these, when you're learning markdown, you're right in one pane, and then you'll have a preview in another pane. Um, and I don't, I have to, um, let me, I don't think I have like the, the stuff here. No, shoot. Well, I'm not going to look at Markdown unless I can like not share my like mirror. I don't know how to do that. Darn it. Okay, so I'm going to, hmm. I think you go to display and mirror your screen, screen mirroring. To mirror displays, hold option while dragging them on top, okay. Okay. A little peek at my email, ignore that. Mm -hmm. So again, we're just going to kind of look at Markdown a little bit. I'll do the basics first so we can just see what it looks like. We've got inline formatting. Um, oh, you can barely see that. So we have italics, we have bold, and we have strike through. And um, if we look at the code, it's pretty straightforward to do italics. It's just, you know, a couple of asterisks for all of these things. That's how easy it is. Like I said, you don't need the editor buttons. Um, another really cool thing that you can do in Markdown, because I'm not a designer, is flow diagrams. 
Look at that. So the code on that is pretty straightforward. You call a library and then you just map where your arrows are. Super cool. And it's accessible. People can read it because it changes it to HTML. It's not a picture. Again, we'll look at it again. How cool is that? I think this is GitLab specific, but that's okay. And then we have things like um, headings and breaks. You know, we talked about headings, you know, breaking down the headings, and all it really is is using hashtags before it. So no, like, going up into that editor and highlighting something and pushing the button, you can just push, push, put the hashtag in front of it and you have your headings. And then another cool thing that you can do in Markdown is tables. So look how cool that is. And again, the code is pretty straightforward. If I want something, you know, uh, left aligned, I use a colon. I kind of call, I use the pipe symbols, and I call out that I want it on the left side with a colon. I want it on the right side, so I call it out with a colon on the right side. If I want it in the middle, I have the colons on both sides. So we'll look at that again. And you can see tables, and they're accessible, except if you have an empty, um, cell, which you can do, an empty cell will break accessibility. But those are kind of the cool things about Markdown, you know, think about like what we usually have as pictures and diagrams and things like that is in plain text, um, pretty straightforward. Let's see, is there one more? Code, code's a good one. Um, there's two ways to do code, and you can't see this here because of the lighting, but this is highlighted, you can kind of see it's a little yellow, so I have an inline code block and then I have a code block. <coughs> And what that looks like in, in the code is basically the ticks. So if I'm on inline code, I just put a tick at the beginning and the end, and then a code block where it's a bigger piece is three ticks on a new line and three ticks on a new line at the bottom. So I wish the projector showed more of, um, of the highlighting. But again, you know what I mean? Like all of these things, when you use Markdown and submit it, you have control over the formatting rather than like you know having the edit editor choose that kind of stuff for you so and with that I'm really out of time so um, thank you for coming and I will post these slides because um, I'll actually post like the whole three-hour workshop slides because it's got the brainstorming exercises in there that are really great they're really great and it's something that you can do on your own as you advance the slide you're like and doing that and that's really kind of breaks down uh, uh, the barrier to writing a little bit. So, thank you.